All right, guys, we're live. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jonathan Mills Patrick. Welcome to another episode of JMP TV, my self-serving TV series. Usually you see me interview some really cool startups that are in early stage. We do sort of have a startup today. He's not in startup mode for his business, but I have Brent De La Paz with me today, to, and we're going to talk about his Kickstarter campaign for his upcoming documentary about his family searching for Santos. Thanks for joining me, Brent. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So quick background for everybody. Uh, my family and Brent's met on a Disney cruise, and we both highly recommend it. They're absolutely fantastic. Very much so. As, and the coolest thing about it is you get to meet some super cool people, just like we did with Brent's family. And we've all, the, we have both have daughters who have exchanged messages, and Brent and I talk regularly about business opportunities and things like that. So that's, cruises aren't just about sitting there and drinking your sangria or whatever else you're going to have and seeing the great views. It's a good opportunity to meet some people. So, again, thanks for taking some time today. Why don't you kind of give everybody the short view of what you do for a living and who you are? So, my name is Brent Delapas, born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, lived in San Antonio for over 20 years now, uh, minus some time away in Houston for law school. Um, I started my career as a prosecutor, I uh, did three years as a prosecutor, and then the last 11 years, a little more than 11 years with my own law firm. Absolutely. That's very cool. And so we've talked before, Brent, you you, um, you do a lot of different types of law, I think I have that right, but you tend to, do you also do some specialization? So my base is criminal defense, that's, that's, the, that's the base of my practice, but in the last four or five years I've ventured out into helping other startups, uh, helping people create corporations or LLCs or whatever that is, that's led me to some work in El Salvador and um, Mexico with some medical tourism, some energy projects, and it's been really interesting and you've been gracious enough to have me on to talk about my, my little pet project. Absolutely. So why don't you, <coughs> good segue, why don't you just go ahead and share a little bit about uh, what you're doing and uh, kind of how you got there, the background story behind it. So I'm going to try to give you the Reader's Digest version because I sure. tend to, since it's, since it's close to my heart, I tend to go Passion, on right? Passion. <laughs> passion there. So um, right before I went to law school, I worked for a gentleman who was running for Congress. He was replacing his father, who was an icon, a legendary congressman in San Antonio. Um, I didn't tell my parents anything about this project, anything about working on this, because it, I didn't come from a political family. Right. I didn't think I did anyway. No, nobody, my parents weren't, you know, go vote for A, B, or C. They just, they just didn't talk about it. So I didn't think much of it. And, and really, the only reason I was working on it uh, in, in complete candor is I was just trying to pad my resume for law school. Sure. So, so I'm, I'm working on this, and just coincidentally, my mom calls the night of the victory election party, you know, and, and she says, what are you doing? So I finally tell her what I'm doing, and she says, you need to talk to your dad, which was kind of odd for me. I was like, <laughs> why? Why would you? So, so my dad gets on the phone, I tell him the exact same thing I told my mom, and, and he goes, and he's real quiet, and he says, you, you, you know your grandfather and Henry B. were real close. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I absolutely did not know anything. Thanks for that. telling me. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, I just want you to tell Henry B., uh, Henry B. Gonzalez, I just want you to tell him that your grandfather is Santos de la Paz. Now, now, mind you, in San Antonio, in the San Antonio community, and probably across Texas, this is an icon. Um, he's retiring, and, and it's not somebody that I don't think you just walk up to. Right. And I've, and I've said maybe hi to him up to this point. I've never had a real conversation with him. I mean, the son, obviously, because I'm working for him. But So I, I, I think I'm going to pass the buck. <laughs> so I think I'm going to say, uh, hey, uh, whoever, you know, tell Henry B. this. So in my mind, it works out this way. I get to the victory party, and it's packed already. And I tell the campaign manager, who's the one that brought me on board, and I say, Adrian, my dad just told me that my grandfather, his father, worked real close with Henry B. He says, that's great. Tell Charlie. Charlie's the, the new congressman. Okay, man, this is not working out the way I wanted to. So, so Charlie comes in, and it's packed, and it's rowdy, and he's high-fiving and hugging and kissing. So I kind of work my way in, 
And I said, congratulations. And I said, hey, I, I just found out uh, my grandfather and your dad are real close. He goes, that's great. Tell my dad. I'm thinking, no. Here we go again. <laughs> I don't want to do this. So, so Henry B. is sitting with his wife at the, at the back of the restaurant, long table. So I, I, it was packed. I just said it was packed. But it felt like tunnels, like, like nobody else was there. I'm slowly walking. I felt my feet were in lead or something. I'm walking to this table. I don't know what I'm going to say other than, hi, you know, I'm, I'm Brent and, and my dad's and my grandfather Santos. So eventually I get up there and I said, uh, Congressman, I'm sorry to disturb you. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Brent de la Paz and my grandfather is Santos de la Paz. And he just stops. He's, he's got the fork in midair and he just stops. I remember this completely clearly. And in and, and those nanoseconds, I'm thinking, oh man, did I say something wrong? Were they really enemies? Like, what happened? Yep. What did, he's what's eating, going? doesn't want to be bothered, whatever. Right. So, yeah. so eventually, he, he looks up and his eyes start to get bigger. And it's just the smile that breaks out and he stands up. And, and I don't, at that point in time, all that stuff just flying like in one ear and out the other because I don't really know what he's saying other than at that point in time, it is the most humbling 30 minutes of my life. Right. Because it's telling me, so from this, this icon, he's telling me how great my grandfather was, how he owes him a great deal, how he wouldn't have gotten to where he did without my grandfather. And none of this is making sense. So I tell my dad, uh, you know, later on that evening, I tell him what happened. And at some point in time, then I realized, like, wait a minute, that I don't even know who he's talking about. Like, Dad, who was your dad? And so I start to dig a little bit more, and I find out some really cool stories. Fast forward to 2007, so I've already gotten out of law school, I've right. already started my practice, and there's a professor that's writing a book about a sheriff by the name of Bail Ennis down in Bee County, Texas, Beagle, Texas. And what the professor found out was the reason that the sheriff got voted out of office is because there's a gentleman by the name of Santos de la Paz that campaigned against him. And, and, and there's plenty of newspaper articles and, and documentation that says, you know, people ask him, well, why did you get voted out? He says, the only reason I got voted out was because of Santos de la Paz. So the, the professor writes a letter to my grand, to my dad as if my dad doesn't know what, you know, what the story is. <laughs> but he says, uh, hey, uh, you know, I want to write a piece about, uh, or at least a chapter about, about Santos. So my dad's like, that's great. So my dad gets off the phone with him and, and turns to me and says, you know, why doesn't somebody write a book about my dad? I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I think somebody needs to write a book. He goes, well, will you write it? I'm thinking, I don't know anything about writing a book. <laughs> so, you know, so now, here when we was, go. When was this? When when does that happen, roughly? This is in 2007. Okay, so, it's, so it incubates for some time. Right, right. Well, because, I, I mean, I liked hearing the stories. I just didn't know where to go with it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I thought it was, they, were, they were great stories for me to know. But I didn't think anybody would really want to know anything about my grandpa, because it's so much time has passed. He passed away in 1990. I mean, nobody really jumped on board to do anything about it. So in 2007, with this new task, my, my dad says, hey, write a book. So I research and I try to learn how to write a book. And I realize that this is very time consuming. But I started doing some research. What I found out was at the UT library up in Austin, one of their collections has a lot of my grandfather's newspapers. So I slowly start to gather a lot of the newspapers. And around 2009, I, I meet people kind of in the movie industry. And there's a local actor here in San Antonio. And I, I told him the story, but I wanted him to help me find somebody to write a book. Mm -hmm. not a movie. And so he says, Brent, you don't understand. This is a movie. And I said, I said, Jesse, nobody is going to watch this movie. There's nobody that cares like I do, yeah. like maybe you do. Be a home but, film, right? You, your dad, your family, all those people. Yeah. And so I said, look, I said, if I, if this was a movie, I think maybe it's a documentary or maybe it's something on PBS, and if the only person that likes it is my dad, then I'm, I'm happy. Right. And he says, you're not looking at this right. So 2010, we really start 
or I really start researching more in earnest. And it, and it took a couple of meetings with different people, but in September of last year, through another friend of mine, I meet Luis Robledo, who owns Center for the Cinematic Arts in, in Los Angeles. And I think just like everybody else, he was a little cautious. He's like, okay, that, yeah, that, great. I'll, I'll take this out of, you know, out of respect for the person that sent you. And the more that he learned about the story, with I provided him all my research and everything that I did, and he says, "This is a, this is a major motion picture." And I said, "Luis, I said I'm going to be very honest." And he happens to know Jesse, the, the local actor, and I said, "Let me be very honest with you. I don't think so, but you're the director. You're the, you're the guy with the experience. I trust you. Let's let's figure out how to make this work." So. This current status that we're in started in September. Um, we've talked to a number of different people. They are writing a script. Uh, it should be the first draft should be out by the end of June, and then we'll kind of take it from there. But that's that's where we're at right now. And like I said, I try to I try to keep it short because I can probably go on for like four or five hours. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that another time. It's yeah. um, so the what's interesting I think, or I know is learning about it over time and it incubating for you and it sounds like you got sort of these little nuggets that were nudges along the way that you kind of needed did you i mean at what point did you go and maybe you're still not there what point did you say mm, yeah this i so beyond just for me this is an interesting story so i'm sure a lot of it led up to for you it was amazing it was your family but was there a moment or have you had it yet where you were like I think more people would like the story than beyond me. Was it just talking to other people, telling them, and them saying, gosh, that's amazing? I think it was a combination of other people saying it. Um, probably January of this year is really that when the light bulb really went on because my, my grandfather was just such an amazing person. I mean, he was, so he, he was a newspaper owner, so he owned his own newspaper, weekly newspaper, was a publisher editor, writer, investigator. Um, he was the person that everybody in the community, and not just in, in Corpus Christi, but in the surrounding, because this was, Beba was about an hour-ish south of Corpus Christi. A number of people would come to him, and he, even in South Texas, all the way down all the way down to the Mexican border. People would come to him to uncover corruption or help out. Like this particular sheriff had a, had a hobby of killing minorities. And, and they said, hey, look, you have to write about him because if you don't, he'll just keep doing it. And my grandfather thinking, what am I going to do? I'm just writing right. about it. But because of his courage, and, and, the, and the sheriff tried to assassinate him twice. I was going to ask if there was sort of any you know shenanigans that went on. He tried to assassinate him twice. The story that I had heard from the time period, you know, 98, my dad told me that the that what he heard was the sheriff stood there with his with his deputies with their shotguns. What the professor found out in talking to people in 2007 was, well, no, that's completely inaccurate. What actually happened was the sheriff had a Tommy gun. He set it up on a tripod and set it up right in front of Santos as he spoke. And Santos just spoke. He, he never flinched. He, he just kept on going on. And of course, I think the, the election was the next day or maybe that, that night or something to that effect. And, and sheriff gets voted out of office, but my grandfather was a, an advisor to LBJ and JFK. Uh, Presidents, yeah. Right, right. And uh, he was the go-to guy. If you wanted anything done, apparently you had to go to my grandfather first, and then one of the local attorneys. And and apparently he was like, if you didn't go to him first, the other attorneys and nobody else really talked to you. Did you get Santos's blessing? Did you go to Senor Santos? At, to, to a spring shop, uh, apparently nothing got done without it. Right. So once I once I started finding out the rest of those stories and people started hearing about it, I think that was the moment that I realized it wasn't just something that I wanted to do for my dad. It was something that I realized people really did probably have an interest in. And it would be great to get my grandfather into the history books as a what what in in books for other people. My grandfather is always referred to as a civil rights leader. I never really saw him as that, mm -hmm. 
Um, I saw him more as kind of like my role as an attorney, um, just helping an advocate. Help, right, as an advocate, helping keep the playing field level. Right. And just making sure that the justice was done, and that, and that was his his deal. He had a number of what well, was kind of scary, I guess. <laughs> he had a number of, of assassination attempts just from different people, um, and yet he he I mean they 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 threw a Molotov cocktail into his print shop and destroyed his print shop, which was right next to the house uh, that he slept in with his kids. So he had and at the time that happened, I think there was only seven kids. And he had, and throughout his life, he had 21 total uh, in a two-bedroom house, mind you. <laughs> Goodness gracious. But, but um, yeah, and, and he, I think, much like most people, he did think about potentially not pursuing the newspaper anymore. This is 1954. I'm sure it'd be easy and to he, kind of back down from it. Right, and he had a heart-to-heart -heart with his wife, and I found out that my grandfather, uh, grand, grandmother was very integral in in running the printing shop and, and driving them around. I found that she drove them around. Yeah. Uh, all these different things. Um, and their heart to heart, he realized, hey, you know what, this is not about, I'm not, I've never done this for me. I've never been the one to seek the limelight or, you know, try to get my name out there. I've always done it for the people. And I'm gonna keep doing it for the people. And and I've I refer to that that particular article a number of times when it's kinda when it seems like I'm into something and it's really heavy, I'm thinking, Well my grandfather got through it. He went through it, I can do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and he was um he started every day, uh, I was very happy to, to find this out, but he started every day, he read the Bible and, it, and it's not uh, I don't say that to to um, push religion on anybody. No, it's okay. But I, I noticed that, you know, I, I see that in my dad, you know, I do it, um, and it, it's just a source of, of, of inspiration, uh, and that's where he drew a lot of, of, a lot of his strength to go forward and do these things, because he knew he wasn't doing it for any kind of, um, any kind of acknowledgement for himself. He was always doing it to make sure everybody in the community was better for whatever he was doing. It's an amazing story. Um, and love to hear more, but we will run out of time. Let's um, can we jump to the Kickstarter campaign? I mean, why run a Kickstarter campaign? Real quick, we got about four or five minutes together. What, why run one? And 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 of course, we'll link to it at, in the post. But um, tell me more about that. So the Kickstarter campaign right now is for the development funds. The development funds pay the uh, cinematographer, pay the writers, travel because they do come down to San Antonio. Uh, pays for the research and everything else in there. That's just to kind of get the ball rolling as they're and, and they're actually doing it <laughs> right now with, without much pay. Okay. Uh, more more covering their expenses for right now. So just trying to get a little money in their pocket to to make sure that we can they can put aside all their other projects. So they're very passionate about this. Right. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to abuse the, the the privilege that they're working for sure. this uh, for for me on this. Um, so that just kind of gets them covered. At least until we go out, um, we'll have a. We do have a on my Facebook, and I, I don't know if you could link it. We will. Uh, we will. I, no, it's on the Kickstarter. It's on the Kickstarter deal. The the little trailer. I, I keep saying the video. Everybody says it's a trailer, and, and it's right. phenomenal, phenomenal work. Andres Jimenez and Luis Robledo put that together, and there's some of the guys that are that are working on a shoestring budget right now. Had you ran a Kickstarter campaign before? Is this your first one? This is my very first. Very one. first. It's well done. I mean, it's really well done. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. What was was that an immediate route you wanted to go when you thought about doing this? No. Um, so I've been I've been self funding it for for since September, um, and then I realized I probably need to to reach out um, to get some help from the from the community. So that's when we started talking about ways to raise some money, uh, and I think the Kickstarter just for me just seems like a faster version of, of my calling one person at a time sure. type of scenario. Do you feel like it also adds at least some validation because the number of people that will contribute sort of tells you there's an audience and that kind of thing? Well, and it's not just the, the contributions that, that that are so humbling and impressive. It's the number of people that that love the story just off of the just off of the trailer. Right. You know, 
they're, they're fascinated with the story. There's a lot of interests. So if I wasn't if I wasn't impressed and if I didn't have that little light bulb that come on in January, I am way over the moon on this. I, I am very very humbled by all the super awesome people out there that that really have gotten into the story. What's what's one tip you could give everybody in terms of a Kickstarter campaign? Because there's a lot of people who want to go that route and crowdfund. Um, I would definitely research every little crowdfunding source. So Indiegogo, Kickstarter, all these other things. I will tell you, I did not realize that you were going to get a ton of, or at least I got a ton of email about, uh, hey, let me help you out. Let's let me help get you. Sure. And, and There's so, an entire business industry around Kickstarter and crowdfunding. It is. It is. It's amazing. And, and I think some of it does work. You just have to make sure that you're not shelling out money to, I mean, um, I think it was uh, Carnegie who said that uh, you know you got to spend money to make money. So I understand that concept. I probably misquoted or, or gave credit incorrectly to whoever it was that said that. But but um, there's probably a limit there. You have because you get so many people saying, "Hey, let me help you out," but then they're going to charge you for it. So just make sure you have the research when you're doing it, and then try to tailor it. And keep in mind that that most of these places have. Uh, fee or percentage that they keep, so make sure in your budget right. that, you, that you try to take that into account. Yeah, well, that's great advice, and I'm sure people will appreciate that. That's uh, one of the things I see regularly with crowdfunding campaigns is they don't build that in. So if they're having to fulfill T-shirt orders, even they just don't they don't even factor in, you know, <coughs> putting all that together and distribution and all those things. So. Well, we 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 kind of run on our time, and that tends to go it tends to go by really fast. But I think it's awesome information, and I want to thank you for coming on here and sharing it with everybody. Uh, we'll certainly link to it in the posts and promote it out a, across the feed. Um, best place to go check it out is on Kickstarter, correct? Correct. Okay, well, we'll put a link to it, and I want to thank you again for joining me. Where can everybody reach out to you personally if they wanted to? Uh, Facebook. Um... Email, which is through Facebook. <laughs> What's the um, law office's website? So, law office of um, Brent De La Paz, So, it's um, delapaslawfirm.com. Okay. Uh, if you want to find out a little bit more information about me, but that'll eventually take you over to the to one of the Facebook sites or uh, email directly to me. However, that works. Fantastic. Well, listen. Hey, thanks for uh, coming on. I really appreciate the time together as usual. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good night.